tonight, um, but the other four are here. Uh, Charlene has asked if those present could identify themselves when they speak. So this is Seth Hopkins talking, and uh, it'll be especially important if you're maybe an infrequent visitor here or an infrequent participant. So the board will come to order at seven o'clock. Is there a motion on the agenda? I'd like to make a motion, but I, I would like to um, amend the agenda. Yeah. Uh, under, after making a 4A, I'd like to reconsider the policy for selling a town asset. Okay. Is there any objection to that? If not, that'll be 4A, reconsider the policy for selling a town asset. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wyman requests the addition. I have an addition to request at 10A um, regarding appropriations requests during the coronavirus emergency. Two, um, two organizations have asked the town clerk for something. I think the board needs to clarify a position. So if we could do that as 10A, uh, consider appropriations requests or the rules for appropriations requests. Any other changes to the agenda? Okay, still need a motion to approve the amended agenda. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Coolidge. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Wyman seconds. All in favor of the amended agenda say aye. 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 That's four to nothing. Item two, approval of the minutes of the hearing of July 13th and the select board meeting of July 13th. You can do them separately or together, whatever the board's pleasure is. I'll make a motion to approve both of them together. Excellent. Motion for Mr. Coolidge, is there a second? I'll second, Seth Hopkins. Is there any errors or omissions in the minutes of the hearing and the select board meeting of July 13th? None heard. All in favor of approval as submitted say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? Aye. Mr. Wyman abstains. So that's three to zero to one. So we'll, we'll uh, even though we'll need to have three in favor of everything tonight. Even though we have only four present tonight. Hi, Seth. Seth? Yes. yes. I'm sorry. This is Brent. I didn't get my, my mute unmuted. Um, could I be added as attending that meeting, please? The, the select board, not the animal control. Sorry, sorry. Um, Charlene, can you, did you catch that? Mr. Bueller was at uh, the, the meeting part, but not to be added to the hearing. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. So we'll consider them adopted as amended then. Item three, the town manager's report. Mr. Atherton. Uh, this is my report for the weeks of July 13th and July 20th. Um, segment six, the bridge slab removal is actually done now. Um, all the all the slab is gone. Um, we had an on-site meeting with John Baya at Fusen O'Neill to discuss safe removal of the concrete beam that runs along the side of the town office here that's right close to it. Um, they were to, trying to determine if it actually provided any support to the office. Um, they're taking it apart very slowly, that one section, because there's a ton of rebar in it. Um, and it does look like some of it goes under the building, but not in the building. So um, the coffer dam has been constructed, constructed for the new construction of the middle pier, too. Um, and that was, the middle pier was so bad that it actually fell over when the last beam came off. So nothing was holding it. So there's some, it's pretty, it's pretty corroded down there. Um, Park Street sewer and water mainline connections were completed last week. I'm sure you all had to drive around the road closure. Um, and stormwater construction will start this week. Uh, so that's moving right along. Um, other happenings, uh, the culvert installation on Churchill Road has been completed. And I'm working with uh, Dave at the Forest Service to close that out. Uh, finally, that's been a long one. Um, had a video meeting with Aldrich and Elliott in the state to review the preliminary engineering report on the upgraded, on the upgrade recommendations of the wastewater treatment plant. I did send that report out to all the selectmen. Um, there were, there's, there's quite a bit of stuff in that. I would, I would like to probably add it to one of our future 
sewer commissioners meetings to go over and have Wayne do it with us from Aldrich and Elliott. Um, you know, we've said before, it's a 50 year old system and it needs some repairs. So uh, paving shim and overlay were completed on Park Street extension, Corona Street and the paved portion of Country Club Road. So our paving's done. Um, and uh, I did receive four letters of interest for the open assessor's assistant position. Um, I did do an interview last week and I'm setting up a couple more this week. So we should have that someone in that position here within a week or so. Um, and just one thing I wanted to bring up that Sue and I were talking about this morning too is we're starting to see a lot of campaign signs showing up on town property and we're removing them because they shouldn't be there. So if you know of anyone or anyone's complaining that their signs are missing, that's why they just, they just can't stick it on town property. So I had a good, a, a bunch of them in the park over the weekend. So we'll continue to pick them up and um, just letting folks know that. That's, that's all I have tonight. Thanks, Mr. Atherton. Um, I know that that document that you got with the engineers about wastewater was really comprehensive and I appreciate you doing that with them and speaking about it with the state. I know that um, we've been talking about that as a 50 year old system for at least the six years I've been on the board. So it may be in fact older than a 50 year old system. And I hope that you are able to schedule the engineer to come talk to us um, in a sewer commissioner's meeting during yep. the time yep. if possible. He's already made the offer to attend. So we'll, we'll get that in the near future here. Great, thank you. Uh, other comments or questions for the town manager from the board? Mr. Giles, anything? Nothing. Mr. Coolidge tonight, anything? Nothing. Mr. Wyman? Nothing. Questions or comments from the public? for the town manager. Uh, yeah, this is Brent Bueller. Hi Brent, go ahead. Um, it, it seems like it might be helpful if there was a one-way sign for the traffic coming from the south turning on to West Seminary. There's one coming from the north, but there seems to be a lot of confusion, folks turning uh, go, to go up the hill um, and, and stopping quickly uh, until they figure it out. So if there was a one-way sign pointing up the hill, up West Seminary, coming from the south, that might be helpful. Yeah, we can look into it. Um, I mean, we did just leave the northbound lane open, so that, that would be the only one to go. But um, as you right. sure, I'm sure you witness it because you're right there that the amount of signs we keep putting up and people still drive the wrong way down the one oh, yeah. way road. So <laughs> no, it's, it's I, probably going to... I see it all. Yeah, it's probably going to take an accident for people to figure it out, which is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, so, so far, so good. Not yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bueller. Thanks, Mr. Atherton. Other questions or comments for the town manager? If you're on the phone, just go ahead and identify yourself. I can't see anybody waving a hand or anything like that right now. And there is always opportunity for public comment on each of the agenda items. So this is not your only opportunity, but this would be a good time if you have something directed toward the town manager. And not, so we'll go ahead along to public comment and participation. This would be items not on the agenda. We'll start with the board, Mr. Wyman. Nothing. Mr. Giles. Nothing. Mr. Coolidge. No, all set. I have nothing. Public comment, uh, anybody else in the meeting tonight with something that doesn't appear later on the agenda? This might be a first, no comment on item four. Actually, I do have a comment. It's Sue. Of course Gage. you do, Sue. Um, I just wanted to publicly thank the um, Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union for letting us use Neshebe School as a polling place. Um, they've been very strict about people going in and out of the school. And so it's a very generous thing for them to do. And I just wanted to thank them in public. So thank you, Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union and Judy Pulsifer and Jean Collins. Thank you, Sue. And just to um, clarify that that's going to be a drive up vote, right? We're not going to go into the school when we vote. Correct. We're going to, we're a, going to hopefully it, vote absentee first, right? But those who want to vote that day in person are going to vote in their cars. I have 870 absentee ballots, and yeah, 
anybody who decides to vote at the polls will be it'll be drive through so they'll be driving through voting and then driving through to check out great thank you sue thanks for organizing that i know that was a lot of work and thanks to the board of civil authority so thanks to the jps for uh, going through that exercise with us absolutely other comments other public comment or participation things that don't appear on the agenda later on Okay, if not, we'll go along. We've got item 4A, which was added uh, to reconsider the policy for selling a town asset that was added by Mr. Wyman. Do you want to introduce it, Tracy? Yeah, um, I, I guess after the last couple weeks here with the 44 Prospect Street property that uh, I don't really believe our, our policy is, is effective. Um, we've had two we had our first two people that put offers on it, pull it out because of the policy. Um, and I just think that we need to look things over again. Even if we go back to the old style policy or rewriting something to the fact that would work and be more effective, I guess. Um, I mean, if, if we're going to do something like this that we've, that we've done on the 44 uh, Prospect Street. I believe it's something that should be put out to a sealed bid, not something that's advertised and put a minimum on it that we we're going to put in for a bid. Um, not not handled the way it was. I mean, I I, I want to go forward. If we, if we still have offers as of tonight, I want to go forward with just getting this cleaned up and getting it over with with 44 prospect but going going forward after that i'd like to have us relook at this policy the way that we're the way that it's being handled because it, it definitely i don't believe it worked the way that folks thought it was going to work you're muted Steph. sorry others with some input yeah, I'm, I might jump in here because, um, you know, I, I originally put the policy uh, or pr proposed the policy together and authored it. Um, I think, in fact, the policy is um, uh, working the way it's supposed to work. And I think the problem was implementation because I think the point of the policy was to um, be very transparent, to make sure everybody knew what was going on. And the fact that a lot of people have been finding out kind of a little bit as we go and, and, um, and late, it means that some people are coming into the process late. And clearly we don't have a, um, a specified way of handling bids. Um, and of course, the other part of the policy, um, transparency was the biggest reason to do the policy. But the second reason was to kind of try to find a way to maximize the value of things that we're selling. And um, this is the part that I don't quite understand. The notion of a sealed bid, um, I mean, would you sell your house uh, on a sealed bid by putting in a minimum offer and then just seeing what, you know, one time people offered for your house? I don't think you would. Absolutely. I, I, I know I bought and sold property many times in my life. And when I'm buying, I expect to put an offer below the offer price and see what they're willing to negotiate. And it goes back and forth and back and forth, often over the course of two, three, four, sometimes six weeks. And similarly, when I'm selling, I expect to get offers that are below what I'm, off, I'm asking. And then people come back and we try to find a middle ground. Um, I, I don't understand why that shouldn't be the way we sell property in town. Well, what I, what I have for a problem is, Tim, um, Last week, our last meeting, we had a $30,000 offer and a $20,000 offer. Because of the way this policy worked, our $30,000 offer was withdrawn, and so wasn't our 20. So um, if that's making money, that's not a good way to make money as far as I'm concerned. No, I would agree with you. I think it's um, a problem of implementation. And, um, but I think going to a sealed bid would be a mistake. I think it would generate um, mistrust that people didn't know, you know, that someone was putting in a really, really low offer and they just didn't think to offer more. 
I, I think that there's a lot of, of hazard in going to a sealed bid when you're selling something. I mean, I realize we use sealed bids when we're asking for contractors to do work for us, because that's a whole different environment. Mr. Chair, can I add to Absolutely. this? Absolutely, of course. So, um, I, I'm a little concerned with the, with the word implementation that keeps popping up. Um, you know, the reason that this kind of was fast-tracked is before we even, or, well, blame it on me, before I even got an ad in the paper, I had some folks that were interested in it. So naturally said, send us an offer. You know, the board had come up with a $29,000 price. We got an offer that was already over that. Usually in the real estate world, and I, you know, Tim says he's done it for a long time. I was a real estate paralegal for over 20 years, so I've done a few of those. Um, you usually accept that offer when it, it's over your amount. I mean, that's really how the, the real estate world works. We're seeing it happen in town and other houses. The, the concern that I have with it is that the, the way it's working is the first bid is always, the first bidder's never going to have a chance because everyone knows their bid. And um, I don't think that's fair either. And where the sealed bid process is, you know, we have an appraised value on a house. We have an assessed value on a house. So you know where those numbers lie. And I mean, when we get to this other thing, we've, you know, we've had a couple offers come in this evening too. So, but um, it wasn't really, it was, the process to me was not, it was a little confusing. You know, as you guys know, I wasn't here last Friday and calls came in because of a post on Front Porch Forum that I've already expressed my concern on. Um, I don't think that was fair to the folks that were bidding on the, pro on the, on the property or putting offers on the property um, when I wasn't able to be here to answer their questions. And I felt, you know, I just ended up doing it because they needed to know because it said they needed to have it done by Monday. I don't think that was great implementation. And, um, you know, had I, had I not taken the day off, it would have been a little different, but that's not how it happened. Um, but you guys know I've stated my concerns with this policy before that I don't feel that it works properly. And I think that showing everybody's offers to the public from the get-go is, it's ticked a lot of people off in town already. And um, personally for me, I don't think it's the right way to do it. I think a sealed bid with a, with a time you know, a deadline is the way to go. And, you know, you can set a minimum bid price, which you guys sort of did, and go from there and see what happens. But um, this was not a good first run on this, that's for sure. The old policy worked fine. There was nothing wrong with it. And I just think this, we need to get, a, get away from this policy and go back to the old one. What is the old policy, Brian? If we get an offer on any swamp lots, we can sell them if there's an offer. Um, this is Brent Bueller. My, my confusion was over the notification. I kept looking for something in the newspaper. Then I saw the front porch form and I thought, well, maybe that's the notification. Then I read the minutes of the select board meeting and it said, no, that was the notification. So I was... Uh, the, the notification has been my concern. Um, so I, I, I was confused about the notification aspect of this and just how the, the bidding, if you will, was to work. Um, do we know why the folks withdrew their, what, what in the um, policy caused the folks to withdraw their offers? Uh, yeah, I, the two that withdrew, one was the length of the process was the first one. And the second one that withdrew today was pretty ticked off that everyone knew what the, uh, their offer was. So um, that's really where it's at. And actually I thought the, the other one was going to call in tonight, but um, they haven't. So. And, and Tim, I, I, I see what, you know, I agree with what you're trying to do as far as, as a town asset, trying to get the best we can get out of that. Um, I'm going to use a dump truck for an example. Um, if we would have had that piece of equipment 
there's definitely a trade-in value that you would get from that piece of equipment. But if you wanted to put that out, if you wanted to put that out and see if we could do better than that, I don't have a problem putting that out, but I, I would want it out to a sealed bid. I would, I would want it out to a sealed bid that would be opened at a select board meeting. Um, and if we had, if we had offers that were better than the trade in value, that's great. Um, and I guess that's the same way I feel about this. Same way I feel about this den property, the way we, you know, the way that this was handled in, um, I, I, that's just my thought on it. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the benefit of the sealed bid. I mean, for example, when I go to buy a piece of property and I know that there's somebody else interested in that property and I make an offer and the realtor, you know, who's playing the middleman says, okay, you know, I'll, I'll bring your offer to the owner. And, you know, the owner says, well, you know, there's somebody else interested. I'm going to see if they're going to offer more. And of course they tell the other person what I've offered because they want the other person to know that to, to, you know, to be able to bid. And if the marketplace is, is an ideal marketplace, you have that bidding process go back and forth until the value is determined by how much somebody's willing to pay for it. And, and that's a clear, you know, transaction that, that, it gets the true value of the thing you're selling. Well, Tim, um, who, who becomes the negotiation team on this? Do we wait every between two, you know, two select boards a month for you guys to make a counter offer on someone's offer? Well, because I think it's not my authority. So who does that? I mean, this well, is the, the thing, you know, you hire a realtor and then how's that, but how's that going to work? Like you well, still got to have a quorum to make that decision. So you're bringing up excellent points. And this is what I think is called is what I was referring to with implementation which wasn't at all a slight at you, Dave, because I, I think this is our first case. And as Seth has noted, this is the first and perhaps the only time we're going to be selling actual real estate that has a house and has a plumbing and sewer and, and has value that's, you know, in a marketplace. I mean, our swamp lots typically won't have this kind of phenomenon going on. Actually, that's not true. We've done a couple other tax sale properties that were tax sales that had structures on them. Just, I just wanted to throw this in there because... I mean, the way that I'm looking at this is when when the swamp lot sales started, and even when you know we started doing tax sales again, um, the whole purpose, and this is the way that I thought we were doing it, was the the purpose was to get these properties back on the tax books, and the DIN property, you know, I had to end up opening an estate on that, and the one thing with that one was that it had been vacant since 2012. Those taxes, we can't just wipe the taxes out because no one lives there. They still accrue. So as we've been looking at doing the delinquent tax stuff that we've got a couple of properties, there's another one in town that's a similar situation that is in an estate and these taxes accrue every year. So we've been accruing water, sewer, and property taxes on the DIN property since 2012. So when we do our delinquent tax list, that's a big chunk of change that shows up there that we can never collect because we, you know, that's why we had to open the estate up. So regardless of if you like the process or whatever, how we're doing it, we we're following the process that was statutorily given to us to do. But my goal from the start of this, which is why I'm really trying to back away from this policy because I have no say in it, that it was to get these properties back on the tax book so we could collect annual taxes on it. That was the bottom line. Yeah, I'm in support of it. I, I think in answer to your question, I actually mentioned this to you when we talked today, but just so everybody in the meeting has the benefit. Um, I think if we come up with property that is clearly going to require um, this kind of uh, broker relationship, it might be appropriate to um, hire a real estate broker you know, for the sale of the property because it would be easy to include in the cost of the sale. And it's very likely that that benefit would increase the value to cover their, you know, the cost of the real estate transaction. You think a realtor would have been on this for $20,000? I mean, that seems kind of low. I, you know, and then you take your eight, was it 8% now they get on it? 7%? No, it's negotiable. And um, Okay. I, um, I mean, the other thing is like, like having a realtor involved, most, most of the time the properties that we end up with are from a tax sale. We can only sell that property for what we've taken in taxes on it. I mean, if, if, if we took that for $5,000 and it was a 
$50,000 piece of property, we can only sell out for $5,000. Yeah, that's a very different situation, and you're right. That's, um, that wouldn't require a realtor. Um, yeah, I, and I, you know, going back to the bidding process, I've had to, I've had to bid, bid on a lot of stuff myself. Um, and it always seems that anybody that has the, the owners of the, whatever we have bid on, when there's been a minimum bid, have been very happy and thought it was very successful going through the bid process, especially when you have a minimum bid that you're going to put out there on it. I, I guess I, the thing I think about with the minimum bid is that if somebody really wants the property, they'd like to buy it, but they'd like to pay the least amount that they have to pay for it. And where if you put the sealed bid out there, they've really got to put their maximum bid in rather than their minimum bid. And, you know, it's kind of like when you work on eBay, you know, if you buy something off of eBay, you start at the lowest possible price and it goes up until you get to the where you're willing to stop willing to, to bid more. Well, and it sounds like we need an auctioneer and not a realtor then. Oh, no, I think that's what the realtor does. Where do we draw the line here? You know, it's like, I think something needs to change because this was a cluster from the beginning. And it's been difficult for me to try to follow this thing when I'm not really sure what we do with all these offers. You know, it's like, I still feel it's not fair to the first guy that his offer went public and everyone was like, well, I'll just go $500 over that. And you know, that's, that's what happens. And I, the sealed bid process is you do your best. You know, we got an appraisal done. We've got the, we've, I said it earlier, that's enough to go on for someone to make a good offer on a piece of property. If that's what they're doing. So I don't know. That and the other thing is you, you need somebody to babysit this. Um, whether it be a realtor or a Dave or Sue. I mean, I feel bad for Sue of all the calls that she was getting after this was on front porch farm because Dave wasn't here. I mean, I just, we're, I, I understand if you're, I understand if you were selling your property and you wanted to do that back and forth, that's fine. But um, we are, a, we are a municipality. And I think that, I think that we've got to remember that. Is there any uh, comment or input from the others in the meeting tonight? Anybody not on the board have something they'd like to weigh in on? Uh, this is Bill Moore. Hey, Bill Moore. Uh, hello. Um, the, just looking at, you know, I, I don't know what this adds or detracts from the conversation, but I know that there are like organizations that, that do auctions for municipalities, but there's a fee that's associated with that. And it's typically not for property, but for, you know, uh, trucks and, you know, they, they pass it along to these municipal organizations. I mean, like there's a whole business model that's built around doing this that shows the, the kind of complications that are inherent within trying to try, trying to get the best bang for your buck on the, on selling the property, which I think is probably why you've seen, like even with our own, within our own school district, another municipality that's here in town, you know, like when they have an old bus that they're selling, they will take sealed bids up until a certain day and then they'll open all the bids and then they'll sell the, they'll sell the piece of equipment that way. And sometimes you're getting a bus for $500 and sometimes you're getting a bus for $5,000. And, but it, you know, certainly makes it a little, little easier for the municipality to deal with. Thanks, Mr. Moore. So what's the pleasure of the board? Is there a motion in any direction? I'll make a motion. We go back to the old policy we had and we can put a minimum bid on it if we want to. So the motion is to rescind the policy that's in place now and go to a policy where the board considers offers at a board meeting. Can like consider any offer at a board meeting? Like a sealed bid type situation. Well, that wasn't the old policy. Um, I'm I'd happy like, with whatever you want to move. I just want to be clear on what you want to do. I think we should have a, like a bid opening for these, anything we're selling. And we could put a, if we want to put a minimum on it, we put a minimum on it before it goes out for sale. 
Okay, so the motion would be to rescind the policy that's now in place and instead have a policy where we establish a minimum bid and a sealed bid process instead. Yes? Yes. Is there a second on that? I'll second it for discussion. Okay, so there's a motion and a second and the discussion, Mr. Wyman? I, you know, I, I, I agree with what Brian's saying, but that's kind of hard to do with when we have like your swamp lots and things of that nature. I mean, I think you'd have to put something different in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to put that out to bid. I, I, I just, I want to him to clarify from that. I believe that what he's saying is that we'd take the offers to a slug board meeting on the, on the swamp lots and anything I, you know, I, I guess that's what I'm asking, Brian. You want to change that, Tracy? No, I just, I just was asking you what you what you would plan to do. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put all your swamp lots or your tax sale lots to, to bid, would you? No, I think it could be on a, a uh, each one separately. But I just think we need to rescind the policy. I, I see um, a note that Sue Gage has a hand. Can, can you, someone who's hosting unmute Sue? I, um, I just, I've been following along with this and I, and maybe, and you could include swamp lots in here as well, but maybe you could, if someone comes forward and says, I'd like to buy that swamp lot for $2,000, then you could put out in the paper that there's a swamp lot for sale. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody interested? get bids to us by the next select board meeting. So that would include the swamp lots and maybe anything else, but, but you'd have that initial bid and probably the, that would be the only bid because that's how swamp lots go. But then you, you would, you would serve Tim's purpose of getting it out in the public um, with an opportunity for other people to bid on it. And then at the very, the other thing that's nice about having that process is there's an end to it. Like, I know that the last board meeting, there were people there that thought they were going to own the DIN property and, and didn't. So it, it, it will, there'll be a start and an end to it. You get a bid or if you have a property that you want to sell, you throw it in the paper and say, get bids to us by this date. And then you open them at the meet at the next meeting and then it's done and you don't have to drag it on forever. That's my thought. So I think, that at this point, because this seems like it's going to be kind of a lengthy process, we should just put all of our properties that we have that we don't want in the paper next month and say, here's what we have for sale. Let's get rid of them. And then we don't have to worry about it anymore. This is, you know, I, I still feel that we followed the policy that was in place that was a heck of a lot quicker and easier than this. We, you know, we could have, we could do some different public notice, but this whole offer thing is a disaster and nobody's happy about it. So I'm actually happy about it. Well, one person's happy. Maybe two people are happy. Okay. Um, I, I suggest that if we're going to change the policy, it means making a new policy because I don't think we can just simply go back to the old one from what um, Brian just described. It's um, not simply going back. It's actually coming up with a different one. And so I, I would suggest that, you know, if somebody wants to come up with a different policy, they write it and bring it to the board and we'll talk about it, the benefits and, and, and then vote on it then. Further discussion? Anybody want to volunteer to draft a new policy? So, Charlene, are you able to read us back the motion? Whoops. Hold on. <laughs> I lost my document here when I came into Zoom. Okay, I have motion by Brian Coolidge, seconded by Tracy Wyman, to rescind the current policy and have a policy to establish a minimum bid and a sealed bid process. Is that clear to everybody? Ready to vote on that motion. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. No. 
No. Any abstentions? So is that, uh, is that Wyman and Coolidge in favor, Giles and Hopkins opposed? Is that right? Yeah. So, um, so it fails for lack of three, but I think um, it sounds like the board would probably be open to considering a new policy if a new policy came drafted to it, perhaps. I would, I would work on a policy. Great. Okay, so can we leave it there? And we do have a property to dispose of tonight um, using the policy that's in place. Anything else on that matter? Okay, um, I, I do have one more thing on that matter. Uh, it's been said that someone was at the last meeting expecting that they were going to bid and like walk out the owner from the meeting. And I was very clear with the person that thought they were going to walk out the owner of that property that their bid was going to be announced and laid over a meeting. So I would like to correct that impression. I communicated with them publicly and privately about the policy, which was to lay it over a meeting. Item five, um, we have an appointment. There's a letter of interest from Ralph Ethier for an appointment to the Development Review Board. Thanks for putting the term in, uh, Dave and Elaine, for a three-year term ending on June 30th, 2023. What's the pleasure of the board? I'd make a motion to accept. Motion from Mr. Wyman, is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Giles, any discussion? Mr. Ethier's been on town boards before. Any uh, further discussion? All in favor of appointing Ralph Ethier to the Development Review Board for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2023, say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? That's unanimous. Item six, consider the tax rate for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. The town treasurer's here. Could we have uh, Sue Gage introduce this? Um, yeah, sorry. I was distracted for a minute. Um, is this our tax rate? <clears throat> is that where we are? Sorry. I was yes, eating please. my banana. I was eating my bananas foster. Um, I did send out all the background, um, where I got all the numbers to all of you guys and, um, boiled down the numbers to tax rates, um, which are the town budget 0.7899. Voted appropriations, 0 0.0788. Local agreement rate of 0 0.0064. Fire district of 0 0.0834 for a total municipal rate of 0 0.9584, which is less than our tax rate last year. I think that's notable. Um, <clears throat> the education rate came in. Uh, homestead is 1.3479. And non-residential rate is 1.5763. Um, I have a little note down below there that says miscellaneous tax of 1,639.15. And what that is, uh, um, the stabilized properties. We have a few tax stabilized properties. And um, they are not stabilized for education or the fire district. So that's a separate tax. I have to kind of manually calculate that and add it onto their bills. Um, so that total for those um, properties is 1639.15, which will go on each of their individual bills as a separate amount. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you for getting that to us early enough to take a good look at it. Um, and for the, the accuracy check that you did on it. And thanks to Mr. Giles for contributing to the accuracy check on it. Is there any discussion on the tax rate that's been proposed or computed, calculated by the town treasurer? If not, is there a motion to adopt this tax rate? I'll make that motion. Motion from Mr. Giles, is there a second? I'll second that. Second from Mr. Coolidge to adopt the rates as stated in the submitted municipal tax rate, total municipal rate 0 0.9584. Any discussion? Any questions or comments from the public on this one? 
If not, all in favor of adopting the tax rate as presented, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. That was unanimous, none opposed. Item seven, to consider offers on 44 Prospect Street. Could Mr. Atherton let us know the situation? So the two that I have in your package, you can crinkle up and throw in the garbage. Um, I have received two more today. I received one for the amount of $23,000. I'm sorry, $23,500 um, by Barbara Sprague. And then I received one this evening um, for $27,500 um, from Mr. Brent Bueller. What's the pleasure of the board on the two offers before us? I move that we accept the high bid of $27,500. Second. I offer. Motion from Mr. Giles and a second from Mr. Wyman to accept the offer of $27,500 from Brent Bueller. Is there discussion? There is not. All in favor of selling number 44 Prospect Street uh, to Brent Bueller for $27,500, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. There are none opposed. Thank you, Mr. Atherton, uh, for going through that process. Thank you, Mr. Bueller, for submitting the high offer and for, um, well, you know you're committing to a substantial renovation of a historic home and for returning it to the tax rolls. Yes, thank you all for your patience on this and hard work. I know it's been a challenge. Thank you. Thank so, you. Brent, I will contact our attorney tomorrow. We can get a purchase and sell drafted and we can get the 1061 notice rolling. Great, thank you much. Yep. Thank you. Item eight, consider the animal control ordinance. I'm going to go a little out of habit here, but to be clear, um, I move that the board accept the eight recommendations from myself and Mr. Giles as presented on the cover memo that is attached to the draft animal control ordinance that was discussed last meeting. Second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second to accept the eight recommendations that are printed is there any need to read these off for anybody? I know that they went out in the board packet, but I know there's some folks on the phone. I don't know if anybody wants to hear any of this. Speak up if you do. We can do that. Seth, this is Lee. It'd be great if Hi, you could go over those. I'm, can you say it again, Lee? It'd be great if you could go over those. Go over the, yeah, okay, sure. So, um, Considering the suggestions made at the public hearing on July 13th and further review of Vermont statute to aid the select board regarding the town's animal control ordinance, we recommend, and this is from Tim Giles and Seth Hopkins, the subcommittee, eight recommendations. Number one, the select board adopt the draft animal control ordinance as presented at the July 13th hearing. This draft is based on the VLCT model animal control ordinance for municipalities. Item two, recommendation two, that the flow chart and the farm size infographics be attached to the animal control ordinance as appendix A and appendix B respectively. Item three, that the recommendation three, that the board find no further action need be taken for Brandon's animal control officer to discharge the duties of a humane officer as set forth in Vermont law. Per Vermont statute, Title 13, Crimes and Criminal Procedure, Chapter 8, Humane and Proper Treatment of Animals, Subchapter 1, Cruelty to Animals, Section 351, Subsection 4, an animal control officer appointed by the legislative body of a municipality is designated a humane officer. Also in that same subchapter, Section 354B, any humane officer may enforce this chapter. The board appointed Margaret Carr's animal as Brandon's animal control officer on January 27th, 2020. Recommendation four, that the animal control officer pursue training for Vermont animal control officers and Vermont humane officers 
Enrolling in such courses as soon as they become available, the cost of such training and reasonable expenses to be borne by the town upon submission of successful course completion to the town manager. Recommendation five, that the animal control officer be directed to work at all times in collaboration with the Brandon Police Department to whom she will address all questions of application of law and process. Any animal complaints referred to the animal control officer by the Brandon Police Department and those generated by the animal control officer will be documented using the Brandon Police Department record keeping system. Recommendation six, that the animal control officer be provided as she has already partially been the equipment required to enforce the town's ordinance, such equipment to be pre-approved by the town manager and to be returned to the town in serviceable condition at the conclusion of her tenure. This does not include equipment required to be a pound keeper for which the service, for which service the town works with the Rutland County Humane Society. Recommendation seven, that the animal control officer be provided with physical copies of the following and required to attest to her responsibility for and understanding the contents thereof in a signed statement returned to the board. A, the Brandon Animal Control Ordinance, including its appendices. B, the complete text of chapter eight of title 13 VSA, Humane and Proper Treatment of Animals. And C, VLCT's Big Book of Woof. Recommendation eight, that the animal control officer, town manager, chief of police, and any others designated by the board meet either in person or by electronic means to conduct an orientation to A, Brandon's community value of compliance being our primary goal in all matters of municipal code and ordinance enforcement, and B, the level of responsiveness the select board desires of the animal control officer. Respectfully submitted. Is there discussion on the motion to adopt the eight recommendations? Anything from the board first? No. I wanna thank all those who have participated in the process, certainly both the hearing and the research and the job description discussions. There's been all kinds of people investing all kinds of time. Um, this is an issue that the community cares about and we value the community input that we've received as we've tried to come up with this animal control ordinance in a way that respects various points of view. Is there any public comment on the recommendations? Hey everyone, Michael here. Uh, Michael thank you Seth. for the, thank you, Seth. Um, and thank you for your recommendations. Can I just ask a question of clarification? Your third recommendation in your memo, I see that you're allowing a humane officer to enforce this chapter, chapter eight, uh, section 351. That does allow the animal control officer, once they're trained as a humane officer, to put liens on each animal seized. So my question for you in looking at, I'm just bringing it up right now, title 13, chapter eight, subchapter one, cruelty to animals, uh, 354, it does allow for putting a lien on each animal for all expenses incurred. So my question for you is the following. If we accept, I mean, if the board, sorry, not we, if the board accepts and we move forward with your recommendations, will the ACO be allowed to put a lien on each animal seized from a Haggerty farm type situation going forward? Is that your understanding? I will clarify what your premise is. So this policy is not allowing the animal control officer to do anything. This policy is recognizing that the Vermont legislature through Vermont law allows an appointed animal control officer all the powers of a humane officer. The board cannot give her powers other than what the legislature has already written into the statute. The board is just recognizing that because we have appointed her the animal control officer, she automatically has humane officer authority as detailed in that chapter of my statute. Without any, uh, any other training. She nope. No get training, no action by the town. No required training to enable her to act as a humane officer. So 
Okay, so setting aside the town's authorization here, I'd just like to put all this on the record. Does the ACO have the power to investigate, intervene, put liens on each animal seized when animal welfare is being compromised and animal cruelty is present? And that's what 354B says, is that the humane officer may enforce this chapter. And the chapter is the entire chapter eight. It's not just the paragraph you referred to. It's the humane and proper treatment of animals. And so if there's anywhere in the Vermont statute that allows that, this is what the humane officer can enforce. So you're saying that as a town, you recognize that the ACO has these powers as granted by the state. Is that correct? Um, yes. Uh, we're, as Seth just said, we're uh, merely drawing attention to the Vermont statute that empowers humane officers to enforce um, the statutes. So uh, I'd, I'd like to pull the ACO into this to see if this is their understanding of the recommendations too, because if the state allows for the following and the town in this recommendation is saying, we recognize that the state allows for these powers. I'm curious why these powers weren't granted in previous seizures. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Please go ahead, Margaret, but then I'd like to weigh in a little. Oh, comment. go ahead, Seth. My comment is that I would, I would like to hear from the chief about this because I think there's two parts to your question, right? Or two, you've raised two points that I think bear discussion. One is the authority of the animal control officer as a humane officer to enforce the chapter. But then you also, which I think everybody's on the same page with so far who has spoken tonight. But the second thing you raised was, you know, could, why hasn't this happened in past seizures with the liens and so forth? And at the very beginning, you let off with, you know, would this prevent or could this authority have been used in the case of another Haggerty farm? And I think that that's, that matter of application is a different matter. And it's not a matter necessarily that the select board has anything close to the legal training to respond to. In other words, I think there still exists in Vermont statute that very famous agricultural exemption. And I'm not willing to go out on a limb and say that the humane officer supersedes the agricultural exemption. So Margaret has offered to weigh in. I'd like to hear from her and I'd like to hear from the chief um, in regard to that question, which is important, but which I don't feel you know, the board has the training necessarily to answer. Margaret? Well, I don't, I don't know that I have the training to answer that either, but I, I know this has been a huge learning curve for myself, and I, and I believe it's safe to say that the town as a whole has learned a lot with, with everything that we've dove into in, in trying to understand what the state of Vermont allows and doesn't allow. And I think that part of the reason why things weren't executed differently is just it's a lot to digest and like if you don't know you don't know and you know I I would like to acknowledge for the record that any movement that changes and moves up for the better I applaud the town of Brandon for doing so because one of the other things that I've learned which boggled my mind is I don't believe that there is a state statute that st says that a municipality even has to have an animal control officer. So I thank the town of Brandon for, for caring enough to at least employ an animal control officer when they don't have to. So, but I think, I think there's a, a big learning curve there and I, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but that the little nugget of information about already being a humane officer because I was appointed as an animal control officer is relatively new information or understanding of information. Am I wrong? It's clear in the statute. And this is what I came upon, which is why I um, helped Seth craft this um, cover letter, is because um, it really doesn't require any um, legal um, you know, training to understand the sentence that you know, an animal control officer appointed by the legislative body of a municipality is designated a humane officer. Right. And so... 
That's just a simple sentence. Similarly, the sentence that says any humane officer may enforce this chapter is also um, not ambiguous um, legally. And so um, that's where I've, I've chosen to, um, you know, rest the, the solidity of this um, ordinance on. Does yeah. Chief, Chief Raquel have anything that he can uh, maybe correct us on or respond to some of the issues that have been raised recently about this? I would, I would just say a few things. You, as Tim just said, the, the statute is very clear and the town is now giving the animal control officer the authority to act within that chapter. Um, related to Michael's question, my answer would be no, if we're looking in retrospect, the animal control officer now is going to be guided if this ordinance is, is voted in as to what authority that, that they have. There was not um, this authority or this ordinance in effect at the time that that first issue was taking place. So we can't go back and retroactively try to um, fix that situation. And then I guess the, the third, the question for me would be, um, and I would think that this would be want to want to be answered by the animal control officer as well is to what extent does the select board want the animal control officer to enforce what the ordinance is and, and what you have authorized her to do by by your new ordinance. Michael, does that respond? If I can offer a few things. So it looks like and I'd want this verified, but I'm just looking at the bottom of the page on the Vermont statutes for Title 13, Chapter 8, Subchapter 1, Cruelty to Animals, Section 354. At the bottom, it looks like the latest update was 2017, which means this would have been in place with the last seizure. So I'm still wondering, and I would love for the select board to be on record saying that they're empowering well, you, if you don't even you want to use that word, that's fine. But you're recognizing that the state is giving our ACO the following powers. A humane officer may seize an animal being cruelly treated in violation of this chapter. There's a seizure without a search warrant that's possible here. And then the liens are also possible. This is in conversation with the Secretary of Ag, and this involves livestock and poultry husbandry practices. So this does go above and beyond your ordinance, which is primarily oriented towards dogs. So I just want that if we're voting in this new ordinance, we're recognizing the state statute here that is giving power to the ACO. I just want us to all be in agreement, which is, I'm in support of this. I just want us to recognize what powers this grants the ACO. Because the state is saying the ACO has these powers. Michael, I'm gonna let the statute speak for itself. I, I, I am not an attorney, and I don't think the board wants to be in the position of interpreting Vermont statute, especially in regards to a very specific case that you've raised. Okay, I, I am seeing some double speak here on the select board. If Tim, you're saying that the statute is very clear, but then the select board is also unwilling to say that the statute is very clear. I'm, I'm unwilling to say anything past refer to the statute, and I think that's what Seth's saying. Okay. I, I, I don't so, to go and put into our own words what we're enabling or what we're doing. What we're doing is we're saying we are supporting the Vermont law. This is we're just participating in the Vermont statute as we're allowed. How do we empower the ACO to go into potentially volatile situations with the power the ACO needs to do the following? And if we're lackadaisical about our, yeah, sorry, I'll just finish up, Margaret. If we're lackadaisical about our support of the ACO's ability to do the following, we're putting the ACO in harm's way. I don't see anything lackadaisical about what we're doing. May I, may I please say something? Yeah, please. I think that there's just this, it's that little bridge here. I, so in all the conversation that I had with the league, and, and Michael, I hope this clarifies exactly what Tim and, and Seth are saying, is what it comes down to is if a municipality has an animal control officer and they decide that that is just a dog catcher, that's all they're going to do, that's, then that's all they're going to do. What the town, if I'm hearing correctly, what the town has done is they have said, okay, we have an animal control officer 
and we want these ordinances for our municipality, but we're also recognizing that the state of Vermont says that a, a humane agent is somebody who's appointed as an animal control officer. We've appointed this animal control officer and we're embracing what the state allows for an animal control officer. Because of the word empower and you saying that it's probably not the one that could be used. The way I was explained by the league is that if I were to go get humane training even as an animal control officer and the town like said, Hey, go to this training. But then I came back and there wasn't something that stated on our policies and our ordinances that the town recognizes that they have appointed an animal control officer that falls under these statutes that I would not be able to act as a humane agent in this municipality. Does that make sense? Margaret, if you and your position as a, Seth, I, I want to defer to you as facilitator of this conversation. Can I respond to her comment? Yeah. Margaret, if you feel comfortable with the new recommendations by the chair of the select board, I defer to you because you're in the ACO position. I'm very heartened by the board's support of this subchapter and the powers within it because that has been the pretext of our conversation over the past week. So, I ultimately defer to you because you're in the ACO role. And if you feel comfortable with it and, and feel empowered by the town's recognition of state law, then I, I defer to you. And I'm, and I'm thankful to select boardman Tim Giles and Seth Hopkins for recognizing this subchapter. I just wanted it to be on the record and make sure that any ACO, whether it's you or someone who follows you, feels empowered by it to, to do what's necessary to protect animal welfare. Well, I think the, the other thing that's important to going into this for anybody who, who may have questions is with a town with a town doing something like this and saying, okay, the state allows for our animal control officer to have the training and be you, the humane officer who deals with this and, and we're gonna we're gonna recognize that. It's, it's not, it doesn't actually empower me to just be able to walk onto somebody's property and take an animal. Like there, are, if in a situation where like without a search warrant, obviously, I mean, I'm glad to see that there's some parameters here so I can work with a chief, you know, it's. Yeah, I, I might jump in and suggest that that's a lot of, that number eight aspect is a, is a, a, a nuanced element of this um, recommendation. I love it. That, that really is going to be the operational part, is how you work with the team of people. You know, Dave Atherton, our town manager, and Chief Brickell, who is going to be your primary, um, you know, reference and, and coordinated, you know, position. And so... Um, but, it, it, you know, even still, we... I, like, Chief couldn't just show up on the, on the property and take animals. You have to have the Department of Ag come, and the health officer has to come. I mean, there are states, it, it, you know... You just can't go out and take people's animals. You have to, there's a process. So I appreciate what's happening. I do have questions about it, however. If it's appropriate to bring those up, please let me know. It's appropriate right now. Well, okay. it might be better to have that during the meeting that we've set up in our um, eight, because in fact, we're intending to have a sit down with you and we can actually talk about how you're going to implement, you know, doing your animal control work. And, okay. and I, think, I think that might be a better place. Um, okay. yeah. It feels like we're gravitating towards um, being able to pass this. Am, so, I, am I correct in understanding that with this ordinance, you, the, the town of Brandon is allowing their animal control officer to be an animal control officer to the extent of the Vermont law with proper training? Chapter eight, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Margaret, is it safe to say that the, the questions that you have now, like if there are some directed specifically at the ordinance that's under consideration, maybe now would be a good time. If it's more directed at like a job description, I think that's what Tim's referring to in the number eight. 
um, that's, you know, that would be a, a conversation outside of a public meeting, kind of with you and the chief as the law enforcement official and the yeah, town manager and so forth. Some of, some of the questions obviously come down to uh, like the technicals, like how calls are coming in and where they're going to and where record keeping is happening and access. Yeah. That all can be there. I, I'm, I'm going to circle back around to um, the, the dog census. And that, that hasn't been addressed in the ordinance yet. And I'm still wondering if whether or not there's been any discussion about that and how the t town wants to proceed with that. I, I would think of that as an implementation question because I think we all understand that the dog ordinance, uh, the, the dog census exists in state law and how we choose to implement that in our town is something we can talk about, you know, on the side, but it doesn't have anything to do with the ordinance. Yep. Am I correct in that, Seth? I, I don't think the dog census would have anything to do with the ordinance. I, I agree. But I think it does go to what the chief has raised, which is, you know, what is the direction that the select board wants to give to the animal control officer in regards to number eight? And I think this is probably a good time for us to weigh in individually um, so that the board, the sense of the board can be established before Margaret goes to meet with the police chief and the town manager so that they know what the sense of the board is. So I'll start if there's no objection. It's very, I have a very brief kind of paradigm for what I think the community wants and for what, me, for what I personally would like to see from the animal control program, which the animal control officer is gonna implement for our town. And that's, I would like an animal control officer who is aware and who is responsive, but who is not intrusive. Those are my kind of three adjectives that I would say fit the community's desires for animal control as I understand them but other select board members or other members of the public here tonight might have other views on that. I think awareness, responsiveness, but not intrusiveness is what I would like to see. And I would welcome others' comments at this time. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, because, you know, Seth, you and I have worked on this for a while, and, and I think you, you've stated it very clearly. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in having, I, I'm grateful that we have an animal control officer who um, wants to be, um, uh, to be paying attention, is the way I would say it, who, who would notice the Hagerty Farm problem um, arising and be able to go, you know, wow, that's something that I ought to be paying attention to. And so um, I, I think that this ordinance... Um, supports that and 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 i i look that um i i also am grateful for your comment that we're looking for compliance rather than a whole bunch of tickets being written because <laughs> i think we all could agree that we don't really want you going around you know um being very um you know over controlling about using every rule but you know i think you'll use your judgment and i think that's what the conversation about number eight is going to be is is talking about how how to use discretion and um, your judgment. Tracy, I think you were about to say something. Yeah, I just uh, would echo the same as what uh, Tim and Seth have said. Um, and I appreciate that, uh, that you jumped up and taken such an interest in the position. Uh, something is needed, but like I said, I, I would agree with, with Tim and Seth on their comments. Does that, does that respond, uh, the chief, uh, to what you were looking for, for the board's sense? I think there's been a lot of hard work done by a lot of people, and there's nobody that can express the appreciation of having an ACO more than I <laughs> um, for complaints that should not be directed towards the law enforcement agency, but directed towards somebody who not only has the training, but has the desire to do the right job and for the right purposes. My concern will be, and will always be with this, with this position and somebody who's actually willing to, to take the responsibility of that role is documentation purposes so that everything that I do requires documentation and why you're there, what 
you know, that, that you're applying the law equally, that you're following what the law is, and that you're trying to get, as you mentioned earlier, compliance, because that's really what you're looking for when you're talking about ordinance reviews. And on top of that, um, just really knowing what the direction is that if, when you have someone that is interested, when you may not have had someone interested in that position before, um, you're going to get a lot of feedback from the community, good, bad, and indifferent. And they need to know who to direct that feedback to. And I, I think it's very clear, or we should be making it clear that Margaret is not, or any animal control is not a, a, an employee of the police department, but it is an appointed position. And when there are issues that they may have or concerns, I'll certainly address the, the general ones that come to our, our attention, but where do those people go to when there is a, a conflict or a question as to how things are being applied? I have the same question. You have the same question? Yes. Like, I mean, yes. It's hard to have, and this is one of the things that we can discuss later too, about the processes and how they all need to get done. But, you know, who do people go to? I mean, well, I, I, me and the board's got, you know, you all can't be in the one same place at the same time to ask a question to. And, and, and we're not honestly the appropriate forum or resource to go to for interpreting this. You know what I mean? Like I said before to Michael, like we're, we're not attorneys, but we're also not law enforcement officials. You know, we, we have next to no knowledge of, about this stuff. And so I think that when we do the process, you know, with Dave and the chief and the animal control officer, I think that, in that process will will come out a natural kind of flow of lines of communication, lines of where are the resources. I think that the one page flow chart that we had that we attached to the ordinance itself, that's meant for the people in the town to know who to go to kind of thing. Um, but you're gonna have like a higher level um, and a more specific kind of um, chain developed uh, through, the, through those conversations and that training that you'll be getting. Any further comment? I did have one, uh, which was that I think we got this, uh, maybe Dave can chime in, the town manager, if he, is he there? Yeah. Um, you did have this uh, draft ordinance looked at by the town attorney and she had a, was it a minor edit or two? Yeah, there was one One of your, um, your references to statute was off. And I can't remember what, I think the other one was just, there were like two subsection things. There was more clerical than anything, but we wanted to make sure the numbers were right on your. Yeah, they, they were both typos because I appreciate you forwarded that on to me, Dave. And um, I was going to make sure we, we bring that up before we pass it, that there's. Yeah, it doesn't change the policy at all. Just a clerical, some clerical. So could, could we, you know, could we, if we're going to move to adoption, could we take it as adopted as um, vetted by the town attorney, meaning her corrections would stand in what we're adopting? Is that a friendly amendment acceptable to the board? I'm yeah. seeing nods. Any objection to that? No. So Anything further you, on this? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Do you want to just send me that email and I can print it and put it in the to be signed packet? Um, yeah, I, um, I have thought you forwarded it to me, but let me grab I don't, it. I don't have the editing. I can't edit this unless I go and change it. Oh, I see. You mean send the policy. No, I, I thought the policy with the two changes in it. So then I'll put it in the packets for you guys to sign. That's great. Yeah, I thought you meant Connie's email. No, I'll, I'll, I'll do the edit and then send, you, send it to you tonight. Okay, thank you. Last comment, Seth? Sure, Mr. Shank. I just want to thank you again for including Chapter 8. I know there were many back and forth uh, emails and threads and conversations. I'm just, I just want to thank the select board for integrating this into the ordinance going forward. So thank you. Thank you. I think that in six years on the board, this may have been my single largest time investment. And this was a process that was complex, you know, um, but I'm glad that we have worked together as a community through the hearing process. I think the hearing process was very valuable. And uh, I, again, 
like the others have. I want to thank Margaret for being the reason that we're even talking about animal control in a civilized and thoughtful kind of way um, so that we can come up with something that reflects what our community wants and what the living things in our community deserve for protection. So if, if we're ready to vote, can we move to a vote? We have a motion to adopt the eight recommendations, which would include the draft animal control ordinance as the town attorney has made a couple of clerical legal citation corrections to it. If we're ready to vote, all in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous, there are none opposed. Excellent. Is Bill Moore on the call still? I know that uh, Bill was, he had an announcement about the Communications Union District. It's not on the agenda, but I think it was late breaking news. Bill's there, go ahead. Late breaking news. So I, I, uh, at the beginning of this meeting, I attended the, uh, the select board meeting in Goshen uh, and they voted to join the Otter Creek Communications Union District and appointed representatives. And uh, so we officially have an Otter Creek Communication Union District and they're now excited about it. So. That is great news uh, from our economic development officer and thank you for being the tip of the spear on that whole idea. This is a new concept that the legislature's allowed and this could be great things. And I'm glad that Brandon and Goshen are gonna collaborate on this project and it's open to other towns still too right bill oh, absolutely no this was just so we could get it established and, and i fully expect them I mean, again we've got some great neighbors to the south and to the to the west of us that are i think eager to join and uh you know, but the fact that we've got at least two makes it official now we have a communication union district we can have the others join us and this will put us in a better position to get some funding for broadband uh, expansion so, Bill, while we have you here and you're talking about communications, can you give a little update on how the Wi-Fi is working out of the town office, the, the town-wide Wi-Fi? So, yeah, I want to say it's definitely town-wide, but we do have two different uh, points, access points. There's one that's located on the side of the town hall, and that's been operational from the point at which it got put in about a month ago. It's an open network. The network name is, I can tell you just a second, uh, Brandon, and then there's one that's mounted to the front of the town, the town offices, which is the robust one that we got from VTEL uh, that is connected to fiber and has about 333 meg uh, uh, download. And those are both up and running. Yeah, they're both up and running. So you, uh, one says Brandon. Oh, it's Brandon v VTEL. Brandon, by VTEL, and the other says Brandon. It's Brandon Hotspot. And one, again, one is, you know, directed towards what's going to be our new parking area on the mobile, uh, behind the mobile station. And the Great. other is at the front of the uh, building serving, servicing the entirety of the downtown. You can get it all the way up to the bank corner um, and just a little bit around it if you got to. That's great news, Bill. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm really interested in that. Also great to be working with Goshen on something other than plowing a pent road, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to Goshen for stepping up. Yeah. yeah. Item nine, um, consider adding the payroll warrant to the agenda. So this is something Mr. Giles had asked about at a previous meeting. And I think the town manager did a little research. Um, is that Dave, do you have something to say about this? Um, I actually, Sue did more research. Than you I did, did the research. Thank you, Sue. Um, so I started to put it out on MuniNet to see what other towns are doing. Is okay. Sue here uh, still on the call? Sue, do you have, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah. What I, what I found was the small towns, the very small towns with one employee or two employees, their payroll warrants go before the board generally. The larger towns where there are um, some, um, a number of people taking a number of steps. Um, they generally do not send their payroll warrants to the board. Does that make so sense? Did, so that's my did finding. Any, did any of those larger towns um, give any background as to why it, they felt it wasn't necessary to put them on the board warrant? 
um, yeah, there were some issues with um, um, privacy issues for certain employees. Um, whether that be maybe child care withholding, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't, they didn't get into specifics, but they all cited privacy issues. Yeah, I, I went in and talked to Sue um, a little bit earlier this week. And um, what I was curious about, just from a factual standpoint, is, you know, what kind of public information are people allowed to see? Because, you know, it's money going out of the town. And Sue explained, and I thought it was a nice, clear explanation that, if um, someone came in, came in from you know a townsperson and wanted to see um, you know what checks had been written out of the town accounts, they could see them all. But Sue would have to um, write out um, you know re, what did it call not retract um, redact redact. That's the word I was looking for. Sue would have to redact um, information that would be this kind of thing that she was just identifying. And so um, that answered my question. And, and I'm not. Um, I, I'm not interested in in, um, in pushing this anymore. I, I, I wasn't pushing before. I was just curious about it. Okay, so um, it's it was on there because it was discussed at a previous meeting. It seemed more research was required. The research has been delivered, and now it seems like there's no. not a desire on the part of any of the select board to add the payroll warrant to the warning. Is that correct? Right. Okay. If that's okay, there's uh, no action to be taken. Any objection? We'll move on. Moving on. Item 10 is to consider the Blue O amendments about river corridors and flood hazard areas. We did have a hearing on that when? The end of June or something in that range. Um, what's the pleasure of the board on the recommendations of the Planning Commission regarding the amendments to the Brandon Land Use Ordinance as they consider river corridor and flood hazard overlay areas. I move we adopt the blue am amendments on river corridor and flood hazard areas. So motion, is there a second? Second. Oh, yeah. Second from Mr. Wyman. Is there any discussion on this? I wanna thank the planning commission for um, holding its own hearings and going through its own process and developing this and getting it to the board. Any other discussion? If not, ready to vote. All in favor of the Blue O amendments about river corridors and flood hazards, uh, adopting that, say aye. 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 That was unanimous. There are none opposed. Item 11, we have some warrants to do. 10A. So 10A. 10A? Oh, sorry. What was 10A? Appropriation. Oh, right, right, right. That was, I asked for that. So a couple of the... Um, couple of the, what do we call them? We don't call them public service agencies. We call them something like that. Um, the people who ask for special appropriation articles at town meeting time have asked about whether they need to gather the signatures like they usually do. I did ask Sue, uh, they, they, these came to Sue Gage and she sent them to the board. Um, I did ask Sue how many we're talking about. She said four. Um, I think there's two classes of them though. There are some who have previously collected signatures and have had taxpayer approval on their appropriation request for one or more years. And then there's a second with at least one member where they have never successfully submitted the required number of signatures. And I would suggest we treat them differently. I would suggest that um, the organizations that have previously collected signatures made a successful petition and had a successful vote on an appropriation, don't have to go through the signature gathering process even if they're due this year, so they get a buy year. Normally we have them do the signature collection every fifth year, according to the policy that we adopted in 2017. So this would be giving them a sixth year on the same petition. Those would be organizations that have already submitted the petition and had a positive vote at least one year in the last five. So I would make that a motion that if a community service organization has previously submitted a petition and has had at least one approval from the voters in the previous five years, that they be allowed to take a sixth year on the same petition and not have to gather signatures this year because of the coronavirus. Is there I'll a second, second that. Thank you. Is a second from Mr. Wyman. Is there any discussion on that? 
Does Butch have his hand up? I can't tell. Representative Shaw, did you have anything you wanted to weigh in? Were you waving a hand? You know, Seth, uh, uh, I do, uh, and I, I and with permission to speak. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I we have in Montpelier, we have treated situations like this, and we have linked them to being underneath this, the governor's state of emergency. So much of the legislation that we have we have passed recently is. Uh, is, is linked to that state of emergency. So I, I don't know if you would want to consider that language in your motion or not. I'm not sure the state of emergency will overlap with our petition submission deadline or not. Um, okay. Just. I mean, the overlapping part is the gathering of signatures because it seems like yep. what he's referring to is that the, um, what the governor passed basically said is that people don't have to get signatures this year. Well, that and, and, and there's other pieces, we, several pieces of legislation that we passed, uh, Tim, were, were uh, uh, like grants to businesses and, and those type of things were all uh, tied to the state of emergency. That's one of the reasons the governor keeps extending the state of emergency is so that this legislation can continue to move forward. And it's just not signatures for... No, but uh, in, running, reference running to this, yeah. in reference to this discussion, it's the signatures. It's the signatures, yes. Yeah. So uh, it's just just a thought, just a random thought that I threw out there. That's all. It's no, it's Thank totally it's well taken. My my fear is so the policy says the following requirements must be received by December thirty first. Five percent of the voters on a petition. I don't want the state of emergency to end on November fifteenth, and then have a bunch of public service organizations scrambling to fill out a petition in six weeks that they normally might have started in July. I, I get that, Seth, and I hope we'll be out of the state of emergency by then, for sure. Yeah. Is there Thank, other you Thank you. Is there other discussion? If not, ready to vote on this. This would be waiving the petition signature requirement for folks that are already on the ballot um, for an additional year. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's four to zero. That's unanimous. So then the other group or the other class at least would be a community service organization that has not yet ever successfully petitioned to appear on the ballot. I'm not in favor of waiving that requirement entirely because once they get on, they're going to just stay on. And I, this particular organization has, has asked at least in a couple of the previous years about the process and has begun the process and has not completed the process. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that we should be using a state of emergency or a pandemic as a, you know, a fig leaf for an organization that has not yet proven it has the support to even appear on the ballot of the minimum number of voters that we require. I would agree. Other thoughts? I, I think my only thought is the one Butch brought up, which is if the governor says you don't have to have signatures, are we trying to um, preempt the governor? I mean, I actually support your rationale. So it's not, that's the part that I'm not uh, disagreeing with. It's just the actual factual legal part. I mean, can we require someone to gather signatures during this time period of COVID? We can't require them, but they're not required to. They could simply not submit the petition as they have never submitted the petition. That, that's my thing with them. Like, you know, they've never done this. So why do we exempt them from having to do it? Right. But I mean... They've chosen not to do it. But you, you could say that about not running for office because they've made it so you don't have to gather signatures for running for office. And see, if someone hasn't run for office in the past, they might choose to this year. And yes, they might be actually getting around the signature requirement. But I'm afraid that's the the element of his um, um, signing. That's effectively what he did. And I guess I'm just wondering if it's legal for us to require. Signatures. So again, I wouldn't weigh in on that. Um, you know, as a compromise, if anybody thinks we should not require people to run around with signatures, I think they at least ought to get the approval of the select board to appear on the warrant. Oh, that's an interesting idea. I like that idea. It puts us in a bad place might not be a good idea. 
I mean, it requires them to make their best argument and in a public forum. And, you know, it's likely you would have as it's possible they could get as many people as might sign their petition to zoom into a meeting and support them. So I, I think that's a great compromise. Other thoughts? I, I guess I'd agree with your first <laughs> question, more so than yeah. on the sideboard. Yeah, I, 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 I agree that if they haven't been able to get on in the past, um, this shouldn't be a buy for them. Any other input from folks? Sue, did you have anything you wanted to add? Because you're the one that they deal with. Have, <laughs> well, I, I just wanted clarification. So any new organization that may be wanting to receive an appropriation or get voted on for an appropriation, they will need to get signatures of 5% to get on the ballot. Well, we haven't, that, yet, we haven't yet decided that, but you know. Well, that, yeah, that's what I, but I, I, so just clarify that before. I, I, yeah, I, th I think the intent so far or the consensus so far is that there should be some intermediate step if they've never successfully appeared on the ballot before by petition, they have to, they should have to do something other than just tell you they want to be on the ballot asking for tax dollars. Yes, I agree with that. And I think all we've talked about are two options. One is just keeping with the policy that has been in place, and the other is maybe bringing it to the select board, but it, I'm not sure that there's three votes to do that tonight. I could check with other clerks in other towns and see what, how they're handling this, if you want. That would be nice. And I don't think we have to decide tonight. Like, this is only the second meeting of the fiscal year. And, you know, the, the normal process goes through December on this. Would you say mm -hmm. we, you know, do a little bit of muni, you could do a little muni net. Uh, so, since we have Representative Shaw um, here with us, it'd be interesting for him to weigh in once again to see if he thinks that if we required people to have a petition if that would fall within the governor's um signing sign statement uh i would uh i would have to say that i don't know for sure uh tim but i would think no i would think that's a, this is a local decision that you folks will make uh, and I, I guess the question that you have to answer is what would happen if we were not dealing with with the COVID situation and that, so then to answer that question is, does, does this board want to say we will, we will hear as, as the one that uh, hear your request and then decide by, as the board whether we're going to put you on the ballot or not? And the other piece is you can just say bring some signatures. So uh, that's, a, that's a difficult situation you're in, but I, I can't tie it to the governor's. Uh, emergency declaration, which was actually uh, proposed by the Secretary of State not to collect signatures for running for office. So it's, it's a little different situation. Uh, it, you know, so uh, you have to the end of December or so to figure this out. So I would say good luck and I'll be quiet. But and I know it's, I know the voter checklist is not a static thing. It's more like a moving target, but what roughly is five or how many voters are there roughly or what roughly is 5%? 3,000, three, there's about 3,000 voters. So 150 signatures. 150 signatures is, is what normally would be required. Yeah. Okay. I think, it, can we lay this over till next time after Sue finds out what the other towns are thinking? Okay, we'll do that by consensus. All right, now we're ready for item 11 uh, to take the warrants. Can we do all three at once? You're usually the one that uh, we have to check with. So <laughs> I, I checked it out, I don't think I have to. Okay, then I'm okay with it. We got a previous fiscal year warrant and a current fiscal year warrant and a Route 7 warrant. Go right ahead, Mr. Wyman. I'd make a motion to approve uh, all the physical warrants, uh, warrant A, in the amount of 111,720.98, B, 195, 68, or 100,000, 
And a root seven for 67, 75, 20. Actually, the last figure is 67,755, 20, just to be clear. Yeah, correct, sorry. No, no problem. Is that a second, Mr. Giles? Yes, that's a second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second uh, to approve all three warrants. Are there any questions on any of them? There are not, so we're ready to vote. All in favor of approval of the three warrants, say aye. 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 That was unanimous, four to nothing. Item 12. Let's make a motion to adjourn. Mr. Coolidge moves to adjourn. Right. Second for Mr. Wyman. It's not debatable. All in favor say aye. 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 Adjourning at 8.35 unanimously. We do have a liquor control commissioners meeting, and if there are no objections, we'll run right into that. Um, item one, agenda adoption. The liquor uh, control commissioners meeting comes to order at 8.35. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Yes, I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Coolidge. Is there a second? Second. Right, yeah. Second for Mr. Wyman. Any additions, errors, or omissions? <laughs> Corrections. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Is there any objection to taking items two, three, four, and five as a consent agenda? That would be minutes, a first class license to Red Clover, an outside consumption permit to Ripton Mountain, and special event permits to Red Clover on August 15th and 29th. Any objection to taking that as a consent agenda? No objection. No objection. No objection. All in favor of two, three, four, and five as a consent agenda say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Item six. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Coolidge, second. Aye. Mr. Wyman, not debatable. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned at 836.